I'm fresh out of vocational school in 1992. My first love, May, and I packed our bags and left our faraway hometown to head south to Shenzhen to find work. Back then, Shenzhen was booming, with skyscrapers popping up all over, transforming into a bustling modern city. But honestly, none of that seemed to matter to me. I was just struggling in a tiny corner of this huge place, like a tiny ant laboring away in a hardware factory in Longgang. Life in Shenzhen was way tougher than I imagined. I thought that, with my education and willingness to work hard, I'd surely make something of myself in this city full of opportunities. But the harsh reality was that I ended up as a warehouse clerk in a small factory, trying to get by. May had it a bit easier. She got a desk job as a secretary, so at least she didn't have to work on the production line. Eventually, I adjusted my mindset. Life has a way of silently teaching and shaping us. I had no special skills or work experience, so finding a job like this was better than being stuck on an assembly line. We were just starting out with no financial cushion, so things were tight. We lived and ate at the factory. Our meals the cheapest box meals from the cafeteria. I didn't mind much, but I hated seeing May go through this, since she was my pride and joy, picking me out of all her admirers. So I felt it was my duty to give her a better future. So many times, I'd wake up from a dream, reminding myself to work hard and not let a mundane life dull my ambition. Three months in, I got promoted to warehouse statistician, still moving goods around, but it was something. I shared the news with May and took her out for a meal, our first taste of the outside world, ordering a couple of dishes and savoring them. You know what they say, once you're full and comfortable, you start thinking about other things. We had already tasted the forbidden fruit, but struggled to find a place. One evening, after dinner, we wandered around and ended up on a hillside behind the factory, hidden in the darkness of the night, finding comfort in each other's arms. When we got back, May said her roommates had teased her about her disheveled appearance. Her hair was a mess, clothes dusty, anyone could tell what we'd been up to. I felt a bit embarrassed, but May reassured me. Only Zoe, one of her roommates, noticed, and no one else paid attention. Zoe and I were on good terms. She was 28, one of the few with a high school education on the assembly line. Every day, she'd bring me reports, the neatest ones of all, with beautiful handwriting to match her looks. Zoe was the factory's muse for many men. About 5 feet 6 inches, almond-shaped eyes, high-nosed bridge, fair skin, and an alluring aura. My girlfriend was pretty, but she still had that innocent look, lacking Zoe's mature charm. But Zoe's husband was the security chief at the factory next door, a former soldier, so most guys just admired from afar. Luckily, Zoe shared a dorm with May and saw me every day. So we got along well and could chat about anything. May once asked Zoe why she didn't rent a place with her husband since he was right there in the city with her. Zoe explained it was unnecessary. Renting a place would cost around 150 to 200 a month, plus utilities and a temporary residence permit. Considering their wages, it was too much hassle, especially with kids and in-laws back home. Saving money to send back was their priority. Zoe spoke about the struggles every worker in Shenzhen faced. We sympathized, but realized we were in the same boat, having nothing. The only difference was our youth. Life moved on, and I gradually found my footing. Then, the factory announced they were looking to promote someone to sales manager. I was eager. My hard work and progress had been recognized and some even thought I was the right choice. In the end, it came down to three candidates, Zoe, Old Lou from Export, and me. Old Lou seemed the most qualified but surprisingly withdrew. On the final selection day, I lost to Zoe. It was fair. She had more experience and knew the products better. Once Zoe became manager, she started building her team and brought me on board. She trusted my abilities and our relationship. Zoe was tactful and caring supporting me after I became her subordinate. May mentioned that Zoe had approached her, saying she understood our situation and if we needed privacy, she could leave the office open for us after hours. I was grateful for such a considerate leader. Zoe worked hard and was learning English. After her promotion, she also started focusing on her appearance, dressing more confidently, exuding the aura of a professional. In my eyes, Zoe was nearly perfect, beautiful, hardworking, smart, and considerate. Who wouldn't admire such a leader? With our efforts, the sales department began to thrive, gaining more attention from the factory. I even got a raise, which was exciting. May told me that Zoe and her husband, June, were thinking of renting a place outside. She suggested we all shared a split cost since we were friends. 
I was all for it. Being with May every day was a dream. So May, Zoe, June, and I rented a small two-bedroom near the factory. Life started feeling good. June was easygoing, a big guy but listened to Zoe in everything. He was friendly, and we soon became buddies, often grabbing drinks after work. Zoe got busier, occasionally traveling for work with senior management. Then, one day, May came home visibly upset. When I pressed her, she broke down, saying the HR manager had harassed her, touching her inappropriately while she was retrieving a file. She confronted him, leading to an argument. Luckily, it was in the office, where things could have been worse. I was fuming, ready to confront that scumbag manager and defend May's honor. But she held me back, saying he was just drunk and didn't actually take advantage of her. Plus, he was a bigwig with connections to the boss. No one could afford to cross him without risking their job over something so petty. As much as it killed me, I had to swallow my rage for the time being. Things had just started looking up for us, no point throwing it away. But I vowed to myself I'd get even with that creep someday when the chance arose. May knew my vengeful streak and warned me the guy was a total sleaze, using his position to prey on countless women over the years. He didn't go full assault mode, but definitely pushed boundaries. I pressed her on how she could possibly know such intimate details unless, no, she couldn't have experienced it herself, could she? After grilling her repeatedly, May finally spilled Zoe's secret. That slimy manager had taken liberties with her too back in the day. I was in utter disbelief. Sure, I'd heard whispers about his wandering hands, but I never imagined upright, powerful Zoe would stoop to that level. They were professional equals, why would she debase herself for that pig? According to May, it was also Zoe could score that sales manager promotion originally meant for old Lou. For a while there, she went out of her way to cozy up to the creep. One drunken night after he summoned her for drinks, he took full advantage before she fled back to the dorms, sobbing uncontrollably. I knew May would never lie about something like this. In that moment, it felt like my whole belief system shattered. The image of beautiful, brilliant Zoe that I'd placed on a pedestal came crashing down to earth. Replaying old memories, I started noticing things, like how Zoe always had that calculated, flirtatious demeanor around the boss that I'd brushed off as her typical poise. But now it seemed more like shamelessly playing up her feminine wiles for leverage. May made me swear to secrecy about Zoe's secret. Of course I knew this was information I could never let slip. It did me no good, and I understood why Zoe had to compromise. An 800 yuan per month raise to jump from factory grunt to white-collar professional was a life-changing opportunity for a nobody like us. Still, I felt immensely saddened, even disillusioned enough to question if hustling so hard was still worth it. What shook me most was the realization that my idol Zoe, the goddess on that pedestal, was just as human and capable of such an unsavory transaction after all. I couldn't let go of this dark knowledge. It gnawed at me constantly, like a fishbone stuck in my throat, being young and naive. I lacked the poker face to hide my new resentment whenever I saw Zoe. My eyes betrayed unnatural emotions. I even started feeling sorry for her poor husband June. Not long after, June and I went out drinking. I clearly had one too many that night and got sloppy drunk. Can't recall what was said, but I know I kicked up a huge storm. June ended up physically assaulting Zoe in a heated moment. The fallout was unexpected yet inevitable. Zoe managed to smooth things over with June, probably because he lacked hard evidence and likely wanted to move on. Like a huge rock dropping into a river, it created a massive splash at first, but the surface eventually returned to calm as if nothing happened. The one most impacted by the whole affair was me. May was at a loss with my sullen attitude. I obviously couldn't stay in the sales department anymore either. Zoe swiftly approved my resignation without a word more. Eventually I found a new job, and May left me too. From then on, Shenzhen became a place of heartbreak and despair that I dreaded revisiting. Years later, I still can't have more than three drinks before the memories come flooding back. Now I often tell the young people around me that for some things, the less said, the better. That is a lesson I have learned in exchange for my entire youth.